here. Seattle Children's wants every child to live the healthiest and most fulfilling life possible. That includes making sure children and teens are protected from COVID-19. COVID-19 vaccines are safe and will help protect your child from illness and hospitalization. This isn't about beating the odds, it's about changing them for all kid kind. Get your child vaccinated today. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I am thrilled to be here. My name is Elaine Selkin and I'm the publisher and CEO of ParentMap. And I'm so thrilled to have Julie Bogart back and have joining with us um, what we feel is a consortium of absolutely the best media, parenting media in the country. We have Chicago Parent, Metro Parent in Detroit, Metro Family in Detroit, apologies, New York Family and New Jersey Family. And we collectively come together and bring you the author, Julie Bogart. On behalf of our really magnificent media partners across the country, it's our collective business to be inclusive and bring safe, educated and loving communities together to help raise our families. And as publishers, we are laser focused on this in trying to better serve our families and being the parents and publishers that we are, I would say we never settle for the status quo. So before we keep uh, learning together with Julie, I just wanted to give um, some heads up on housekeeping items. So first of all, the webinar today, many people asked throughout the webinar, it is being recorded, it will be published for educational promotional usage, and everyone who registered will receive it so that they can watch it in their leisure or um, share it. We also invite you to use the Q&A at the bottom of your screen if you have questions. Julie is going to present for about 45 minutes, and then at the end, um, we've already gathered some questions, but we will add yours in and um, try to get as many as we can in. And then we are also giving away a $100 gift card from Amazon today, and that is available to people who are on the on the live webinar, and we'll announce it at the end. Again, I want to thank Chicago Parent, Metro Family in Detroit, New Jersey Family, and New York Family for joining us. Also, a very special thanks to our um, presenting sponsor, Seattle Children's Hospital. They've been our partners for many, many years. And also to our platinum event partner, the Gates Foundation Discovery Center, as well as Dartmoor School and Washington College Savings Plan. So Julie Bogart is the author of the indispensable book, The Brave Learner, Finding Everyday Magic in Homeschool Learning and Life, which has inspired and empowered countless thousands and thousands of home educators. Her latest book is Raising Critical Thinkers, A Parent's Guide to Growing Wise Kids in the Digital Age. Julie's online coaching community podcast and popular Instagram account are lifelines for tens of thousands of parents all over the world, and we are just rejoicing at having you with us again. So welcome, Julie. Oh my gosh, what a beautiful introduction. I'm so thrilled to be here. I enjoyed being here last time and it is wonderful to be with you all. Uh, just to make me feel like I'm not alone in this space, please say hello in the chat and tell me where you're tuned in from, what city, what state. Uh, select the blue bubble that says everyone, and then that way everybody can see. So we've got Kristen in from Chicago, San Francisco, Seattle, New York. Oh my goodness, Los Angeles, Texas, Bellevue, Washington. Oh, this is fabulous. Wow, it's going so fast, I can hardly read it. New Zealand is here. Oh, Los Angeles, beautiful. Melbourne, Australia, very good. Thank you so much for joining today. I'm really looking forward to this being a collaborative experience. Feel free to talk amongst yourselves. Sometimes chatting in the chat helps you feel more present. Sometimes it's distracting. So do what serves you best. I will be sharing um, from this book. This is what it looks like. There is a free download at the website, Raising Critical Thinkers, that is to help facilitate a book club conversation or a conversation with yourself. So if you want to go to that website and download that free guide, you are welcome to. I designed it because 
I think we grow best in thinking when we're in conversation with others. And today, what we're going to look at is how to be in conversation with your children. Uh, one of the challenges of writing Raising Critical Thinkers is that for so many parents, they have a perception of what critical thinking is, but I find that it is not accurate to what I think critical thinking can be. So when I was writing the book, I wanted to help adults rethink what they think about thinking before they start helping their children. So first, let's get some assumptions out of the way. Uh, in the chat, I'd like you to write just a two word or a sentence definition that you associate with critical thinking. So take a moment to think about it and then just pop those in and I'll start looking uh, decision science. Ooh, I love that word pair. I said two words. She really did it. Think again. These are great. Ask questions. Don't make assumptions. Weigh options. Perspective shift. You guys are great at this. How? Why? Deep thinking. Being curious. Bigger picture. Active listening. Considering other views. Mindful. Okay. You guys are amazing. This is going to be a lot of fun. Thinking outside of the box. Bigger picture. Questioning everything. Devil's advocate discernment, great word. Love it. Thank you so much. Pause, reflect. Ooh, ooh, good ones. So when I spent this last year going like on radio shows and podcasts, I found it really interesting that so often the hosts, and I'm about to even talk about a gender here, a lot of men who are hosts, um, came into our conversation thinking, I'm a great critical thinker. It's the people out there who don't think well. Now, I'm not saying women don't feel that way too, but I wasn't interviewed by men when I wrote The Brave Learner. To a person, it was women interviewing me. But critical thinking seemed to call up a whole other group of podcasters and radio show hosts. And one of the things that I discovered very quickly is it didn't matter the politics of the person. Each of us on some level feel like we're good at critical thinking. And what we mean by that is we're really good at identifying the flaws in somebody else's critical thinking. How many of you have that feeling like, I have a good opinion that is well thought out about why your opinion is wrong? <laughs> I have to confess that was me for many years of my young adulthood in particular. And the reason for that is when we sit inside of our own bodies, we are available, what is available to us, what we are aware of are all the pieces of information, identity, experience, and education that created the point of view we have. And because that lives inside both visible and invisible factors, we feel like everything we think is really logical and makes good sense. In fact, it's similar to the feeling many people have of being great at driving, right? How many people think I'm a really good driver? And yet we have evidence to prove that accidents happen every day, even people who are supposedly good at driving. Why would we persist in an illusion about ourselves? Well, it's because when you are behind the steering wheel of your thoughts or your car, you are making decisions based on all the factors that come to you and your internal logic system is affirming each calculation you make. So whether it's driving a car or driving your thinking, you feel comfortable because you're using all the available data to make the next judgment. And that's why critical thinking can be tricky because we can trick ourselves. So when I talk about critical thinking, Here's what I consider a good definition. This will be the one we use for today. Obviously, there are more definitions than mine. This is just the one I used to inform and guide my research. Critical thinking, the ability to evaluate evidence, to notice bias as it kicks into gear, to consider a variety of experiences and perspectives, even when they make you uncomfortable, and then to render a possible verdict, what you believe to be true for now. That's the heart of the critical thinking task. 
So when I think about critical thinking, I invite you to consider that it is doing what I call an academic selfie, like taking the camera lens and flipping it around on yourself and saying, what are the factors that shape how I think? What are the biases that I have that I'm not paying attention to that control the way I think? For instance, imagine yourself on Facebook right now and you start scrolling and all of a sudden some high school friend you haven't talked to in a long time posts an article and you read the byline of this article and you know who it is and it's someone you don't agree with. It's somebody you've already decided not reliable. Or maybe it's a news organization that this article comes from and you're like, that's not the news I watch. What happens in your feelings about the other person? Do you immediately think of them as ignorant or poorly informed or goodness, what happened to them since high school? <laughs> Do you feel immediately, well, here's my tell. If I feel smug, I know that I'm not critically thinking. The moment I feel smug or a little superior or a little condescending, I'm not critically thinking. What I'm doing is I'm buying into my own perspective at the expense of understanding the other person. So when we start our critical thinking journey, where we want to begin is recognizing that our perspectives are so personal to us. They feel like the skin that's on our body that we don't think about. And we live inside of them so completely. And we're so at home in that space that a lot of times we're unable to consider another point of view because we've already decided that doesn't feel like skin. That doesn't feel like home. Therefore, I can't trust it. Today, when we are talking about critical thinking, we are going to talk about first how to think about yourself. And then we're going to talk about how to impart some of this to your kids. I've got three key ideas I want to go over. And the first one is what is a critical thinker, which is what we've already begun to discuss. Secondly, how do you build a critical thinker? How do you shape or guide your child's journey to being an effective critical thinker? And then <laughs> once you've taught them, they are sure to disagree with you. They're going to challenge some of your most sacredly held beliefs. What do you do then? How do you support a child when they are disagreeing with you or rejecting a value that you have held very close and have adopted for yourself. So let's look at those three categories. When we think then about how to become a critical thinker, one of the things we're faced with immediately is sources. So when you're scrolling through Facebook and you see this friend who's posting this article that you don't agree with, what we're usually arguing about is the authority behind that source. And we discover those authorities that we trust most often not through a rigorous, informed investigation. Maybe we do in grad school, sometimes a little bit in college, but once we're kind of comfy in our own homes and careers, we sort of slough off the academic disposition, and then we enter into a well-held belief system. And that is usually shaped by our best friends. Where are our best friends found? Well, they're found in our political affiliation. They're found in the people we're training for a marathon with. They're found with our religious groups. They're found in our neighborhoods. They're found in our families. The people that we feel most loyal to have more to do with the beliefs you hold than you realize. And once you've found yourself sort of nestled in that community and you feel cozy there, it is very difficult to set aside that identity piece and to be quote unquote objective. Now, we all know because of Derrida and Foucault and postmodernism that ob objectivity isn't real. There is a subjective personal experience that we use to relate to absolutely everything. But what we know is that there is a way to sort of set that bias over here and to at the same time, give ourselves the opportunity to be impacted by new information. The riskier that 
comparison is, the more it will alienate you from your community, the more likely it is you will not convert your ideas or stay open to a new presentation of facts. So now that you think about that, just imagine who that community is for you right now. Where would you most likely risk excommunication if you were to change your position politically or on a social issue or your posture about education or the way you parent or the way you deliver education to your children? Who would you lose if you changed your mind? That feeling that you're identifying right now is exactly what your kids are going through every time they get online and they're in an online chat with their gaming friends or they're watching a YouTube video or they're sitting at your dinner table or they're participating in their religious services. They are being shaped and influenced all the time by the communities they value just like you are. And so part of this journey is helping yourself and your children to recognize that impact. We don't have to neutralize it or get rid of it, but we do have to admit that it's there. And one of the places to begin this critical thinking journey is to identify those. So I give a whole bunch of criteria in my book about how to identify them, but I wanted to put you first in touch with that feeling. So there's an example I give in the book of how source and authority really impacts our thinking. Do you remember the story of the three little pigs? I'm sure you do. It's a very common fairy tale. When my son Noah was like three years old, he became obsessed with it. We spent a ton of time reading the story, rehearsing it in the bathtub. He got to the point where he could say, and he huffed and he puffed and he blew the house in every time he saw it coming. This story became so dear to us that one day when I was at the library, I saw a new book. It was called The True Story of the Three Little Pigs, and it is by an author named John Shezka. But on the cover of the book, it says that the author is A. Wolf, okay, A period Wolf, okay? So you can already feel that John Shezka is toying with us, the readers. But for a three-year-old or a six-year-old, what position are they taking as they have this book read aloud to them? This book is telling the perspective of the wolf, but here is a short synopsis of the story. The wolf is claiming that his grandmother's birthday was a certain morning, and he wanted to bake her a birthday cake. What a loving wolf. And yet he was out of flour. So he decided to walk to each of his neighbors looking for a cup of flour, and he started with the pig in the straw house. Unfortunately, this wolf had a cold, and he could not control his sneezing. And being a big wolf, when he sneezed, he blew down the entire straw house, and it was such a powerful sneeze, it killed the, the pig. And what kind of wolf would he be if he allowed all that ham to go to waste? So he went ahead and ate the pig. And then he made a trip to the next house and repeated the exact same scenario. As you can see, this wolf who is giving this report from the jail cell is representing a completely different perspective than the one we all take as truth, as the gospel version. Here's what's interesting. When I read that book to my son, Noah, it, his eyes got so wide. It was like for the first time he considered that there might be another perspective. There might be another way to tell that story that makes it make sense. And interestingly, I did a survey of my Brave Writers staff members, who most of whom either were homeschooled or grew up as millennials, and they remember their parents reading that book to them. And I said, do you remember thinking it was a spoof or did you believe it? And on our staff, all the millennials under 40 said that as children, they believed that was the true story because the cover said the true story of the three little pigs. Meanwhile, their parents were laughing like I was. I thought, oh, this is an amazing spoof. I knew John Sheska. I knew he was a humorist. I knew this was satire. When we talk about critical thinking, then one of the most important questions to ask 
about anything, any story, any data, any fact is says who? Says who? What is the source of authority for this perspective? And we tend to select authorities that align with us. It's really hard for us, for instance, if you're a person who, let's say, is trained in medicine to listen to someone talk about chakras, right? But if you're a person who's had a bad experience in medicine, and then you meet someone who talks about chakras, suddenly you're open in a way that someone who was trained in a medical scientific model might not be. So when we're talking about perspective taking, we're talking about sources of authority, experience, um, how much background knowledge we have. Noah, when I read him that book, had no background in satire. So he was vulnerable and open to a completely different perspective. I, on the other hand, was so established in this omniscient perspective of the three little pigs, I was discounting the true story of a wolf before I even opened the first page. One of the tools you can use then when you're working with your kids is to explore and investigate perspectives just for fun. One of my favorite activities that I did with my kids when we were raising them is we would watch like a Disney film. And as the film got going, I would hold up the remote control and then I'd push pause and I'd say, and this might be just after the opening action scene, who are we rooting for? Who, who is it? And suddenly my kids knew. They knew who they were rooting for. I would say, well, why are we rooting for them? Because they're being chased. Well, who's chasing them? The bad guys. Well, how do we know that these aren't good guys chasing a bad guy? Oh, well, I don't know. The music seems really happy. And the guy in the front is smiling. Do bad guys smile? <laughs> oh, well, I guess sometimes they do. What other clues are telling us that the person in the front is the good guy and the person in the back is the bad guy? Um, could the person in the back think they're the good guy, even though they're the, the bad guy? Like asking these questions to get people to start surfacing perspectives is the way we build critical thinking skills. We don't just do it by comparing a perspective to our correct one that we already hold. Can you feel that difference? And when we're looking at facts, facts themselves, they're the irreducible information about an item, but no one just talks about facts. They talk about facts in the context of a story, whether it is a researcher conveying data and explaining why it's relevant, or somebody literally taking their own personal experience and calling it a fact. There's a huge continuum there. And when we're raising our kids, we want to put them in touch with the idea that no matter what they encounter, there is an underlying story and a narrator who is shaping how we receive it. One way then we grow critical thinkers is to give as many narratives as possible find as many narrators of the same data, the same story, the same opinion, so that they have the opportunity to be exposed to a wide array of ideas, not just sort of a single narrow track. Now, you may be saying to yourself, yes, but Julie, there are some ideas that are true and some ideas that are categorically false. If we believe that, we actually want to understand why we give credence and credibility to our sources. On what grounds do we accept them? And that's something I go into in a lot more detail in the book, but that is the idea I want to plant as a seed in your imagination. So how do we go about then building this critical thinker, your child? Uh, part of the way we do it is in my part two of my book, and it is built around the notion that there are three sources that we get our data from. So when we talk about story, we're like, well, that's fiction. It has some ideas to it. Data, research, science, that's more objective or it's something we can't argue with as much. So we start to think in these categories. But I would like us to look at it differently than that. There are three ways that we receive the information that shapes our ideas. The first way is through reading. We're gonna talk about that in a moment. 
The second way is through experience. And the third way is something I call encounter. So let's take each of those one at a time. So experience, I mean, excuse me, reading is the primary way we learn in school and every day of our lives. We're reading our phones, we're reading screens, we're reading a book, right? We use reading because it's so efficient. We can gather more information, more data, more narrative through reading words than all the experiences and encounters you're going to have in your life because it consumes very little energy. You sit in a chair, your eyes go over words, you suddenly have information. Reading is efficient, but it's also very safe. You can read skeptically, or you can read believing credul credulously. You can read by skimming, or you can patiently read every single word and listen with the intent to understand. You can read only the text and skip all the numbers. That tends to be my habit. Numbers don't stick with me as well. So if I'm reading a paper that's filled with a lot of statistics, how well is that case being made for me? How well am I going to understand or accept the information? I'm looking more for logic and anecdotes and principles than I am for just straight data. And let's even talk about data. How often are research and data points um, manipulated to have an impact? If I can't understand how the data is collected or what the benchmarks are for that data, I might misunderstand it. This happened to me not too long ago, last year. I was scrolling through Instagram. Maybe it was during 2020, actually. Anyway, I saw this um, detail that Naomi Osaka had served her fastest serve in her career. And so I told my boyfriend, who's a big sports fan, guess what? Naomi Osaka served a serve at 194 miles an hour. And I was so impressed with myself because I never remember numbers. And my boyfriend said exactly in that moment, not possible, Julie. Nobody serves that fast. I said, no, it's true. She really did. I saw it. I remember the number. He says, it's not possible because John Eisner, who's a man, has served the fastest serve of all time, and it was 157 miles per hour. 194 miles an hour would harm someone. And she's a woman. I just don't believe it. And then I got kind of hot under the collar, but also worried and confused <laughs> because I was working so hard to remember the number. And I couldn't understand how I had gotten it wrong. So I pulled out my phone, scrolling through Instagram. As I'm getting there, Jim says, wait a minute, where was she doing that serve? I said, the Australian Open. He said, could it have been in kilometers per hour? And there it was. I had already passed on misinformation because I didn't know the method of measurement that is used for that data. And I did not know the benchmarks, which is the fastest serve. So what I was being impressed by was a big number and no context for the meaning. So when we're talking then about reading, can you see how it's both safe and sometimes it can also trick you? You can think you understand something, but because I'm not actually in that field, I'm not measuring it accurately. I'm not receiving the information in a way that is accurate to what it intended to communicate. So when we read, a lot of times we are moving quickly and we are rely, relying on the information to inform us and we can feel incredibly informed. We can read so many books and think we really, really know. But here's the problem. What if you only read about violin? Imagine, for instance, you decided to become an expert on violin. You read every book available. You learned how it was built, how to play it, how the strings are strung. You learned how to tune it, how to fret it. You understood the difference between Mozart's kind of violin music and playing in a fiddle on a fiddle in a bluegrass bar by reading about it. If all you had ever done is read about violin without ever hearing it played, would you consider yourself well-educated about violin? Say in the chat, is that enough? I don't think it is. Because without having heard a violin, is it possible to say you know the violin intimately? 
So when we talk about reading, reading gives us a foundation, it acquaints us, it informs us, and it delivers a quantity of detail that we can't get as quickly or as efficiently. But when we talk about experience, going to a symphony, going to a bluegrass bar, watching your child learn how to play violin, suddenly your appreciation for what this instrument is, is enriched by your five senses, by your body. You are actually now in communication with violin. Same thing happens if you read about another country versus being a tourist there. You read about war versus going as, let's say, an ambassador to survey a war zone. Experience deepens everything you read. It is still under your control to a certain extent, but not to the degree that reading is. I would put experiences in the category of those things that don't make you feel too uncomfortable yet. Watching a movie, attending a performance, visiting a country, um, going on a field trip. Experiences are still meaningfully under your control, but they give you the opportunity for a full body relationship to the topic. The third version then of actually really learning, pulling the information all the way in is what I call encounter. Encounter changes the power differential. So whereas you could read about violin, listen to one played, even live music, if someone puts a violin in your hand, forget about it. <laughs> Suddenly, everything you thought you knew about violin goes out the window because you're like, wait, what? Um, how does my finger work? Why does that sound scratchy? The bow isn't making any sounds. I read everything there is to know about it and it's helping a little, but still, I can't really do it yet. Once you are in that inverse where you are overwhelmed by what you don't know, you are in an encounter. So whereas you could read about another place, you could visit that place as a tourist, a deeper experience, an encounter is moving there, having to learn the language, learning how to cook, visiting the post office and needing a nap afterwards because it wore you out so much. Encounter says, I really don't know. This impact on me is flipping my world. You will know you're in an encounter when you feel over your skis. Like, I don't have enough resources to meet this with adequate understanding. That's what it feels like to be in a war versus watching it on TV versus reading about it. So as we think about critical thinking then, one of the things I advise is that we build up a reading habit, we enrich that reading with experiences, and then we seek encounters as often as possible. And I'm going to give you some practical examples of all three. Reading, because of the internet and the way the world is now with um, digital media, is starting to erode the capacity to sustain long form deep dive reading. You know, the kind where you curl up with a book on a couch for an hour, or you sit in a library and you study and you read for an hour straight. One of the reasons for this is that our ancestors were developed what is called hyper focus attention states. This is where they are always on alert for a, note, for a notification, like the down tick of temperature. Uh-oh, I need shelter. The grunt of a warthog. Uh-oh, I need to move away from this bush quietly and slowly, right? And quickly, whichever. I don't know how to avoid warthogs. Um, but the hyper-focus attention state is one that is as deep in us as any. It's primal. Until we developed sort of communities like walled cities, libraries, universities, where you could feel truly safe from predators or from the elements, we could not develop deep attention focus states, a deep focus attention states. At the dawn of the printing press with libraries and universities and monasteries, people began to be able to sit silently and read without fear of any threat. Here's what took place for the human brain during these last 1500 years. We have learned 
to sit with multiple perspectives simultaneously without having to render immediate responses. By reading deeply and reading thoroughly, we don't have to vote. We can read a perspective we don't agree with and let it ride sidecar to our established belief and sort of examine it and take it apart and put it back together and compare it to another one and allow it to make associations with other ideas we've encountered. In other words, private, deep focus attention reading is a primary critical thinking skill. But what has happened with the internet? Suddenly we have like buttons, comment boxes, character counts. We've got the red ding and uh, the red dot and the ding of notification acting like the grunt of a warthog pulling us out of a deep state. We feel called on to render an opinion like we're voting every single day on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. We're saying with our words, I read that soundbite and now I'm voting because I'm being called on to do it for the sake of championing my authenticity and integrity when it's actually not required, but it's this deep old programming. So what we want to do for our families is actually start to cultivate a deep reading habit. You don't need to do it every day, but you can do it several times a week. And it looks like this. You're going to turn off your phone and put it in a basket and hide it in another room. Research that has been done has shown that even the presence of your phone in the room with you siphons off attention. Isn't that wild? It's sort of like, let's say you're a diabetic and you can't have sugar. Leaving donuts on the counter versus putting them away in the cabinet is going to help you not want to eat them and not think about them. So what you want to do instead is move those phones out of the room, set the timer, maybe start with seven or eight minutes and have everyone, including you, get a real book, you know, a book that you hold in your hand, not a di digital device, and read. Tell your kids if they get fidgety or they start to lose focus to just gently remind themselves to go back to the page. Because here's what's amazing. If you can get past that first three to five minutes, you will drop into the deep attention focus state. And that will sustain you. But you have to get over this squirreliness of the hurdle. And that is a way to allow your kids to have private thoughts. Critical thinking depends on private thinking. It cannot be that your children are constantly performing opinions. One of my least favorite activities in school is asking kids to have debates. Please don't ask them to have debates. Ask them to have conversations that include as many ideas as possible to address a topic. So instead of saying, are you pro or con on gun control, let's say, who's affected by legislation on gun control? Who are all the people who care about this topic? How do we include more of them in our solutions? What are ideas we could all discuss together that help us address as much of this topic as possible? That is sort of what's going on when you read privately and you include as many perspectives as you can. And you allow for that private thinking not someone constantly monitoring to see if you're having the right thoughts. Secondly, experience. Once you've done some reading and some thinking, consider adding field trips, experiences, excursions, travel, meeting people in your town who are hobbyists. I remember my son, Jacob, when he was really interested in astronomy, we went down to the observatory here in Cincinnati and we met all these older men and women who had been hobbyist astronomers and they let us look through their already focused telescopes and we saw Jupiter and we saw the moon and we saw various stars. This added so much to our reading. In fact, it made Jacob want his own telescope. And so for his birthday, that's what we bought him. He was about 11 at the time. He figured out how to line it up and use it correctly. And one day at four in the morning, he woke us all up and we came down outside into like 20 degree weather or lower <laughs> out on our front steps. And he had aligned the telescope with Saturn. And suddenly for me, the first time in my life, 
I had an encounter with the planet and here's what erupted from my mouth. Oh my gosh, Jake, Saturn, it's real. And then I just started crying because for my whole life, Saturn had just lived in the pages of a book. It was almost shocking to realize it was really there and I was looking at the visible ring. This is what encounter does. It upends the comfortable relationship you thought you already had and it gives you a new perspective. Kind of like when all of the astronauts left the earth and looked back at our little blue marble and they had this complete shift in how they saw the planet that we all love and live on. When we are guiding our children through these three ex reading experiences and encounters, one of the meta messages I hope that they will take away is that if they haven't had an encounter level interaction with the subject, their opinions that they hold should be held with humility. I know for me that science has not been my strong suit. So when I'm reading scientific arguments for or against climate change, for or against vaccines, for or against any topic, I have to hold my opinions with a lot of grace because I've not done the research. I'm not qualified to evaluate the arguments. I am mostly trusting my community to do the vetting for me. But that is not the same as an encounter level relationship. And we are all interdependent today, all of us. We have the challenge, don't we, of trusting people when we ourselves cannot vet them. But what I wish that would inculcate in us is humility rather than hubris, anger, and hurling invectives and insults at one another. I think my generation, it's too late for us. So you can't fix us. You can't fix your parents. <laughs> if you're young and you have parents who have gray hair like me, it might be over for them. But I really believe this revolution can happen in your living room. And this is why I wrote the book. It needs to start at home. And that brings us to our third point. Once you've started to give your kids the opportunity to read, have experiences, have encounters, to ask them these provocative questions like says who and why, they're going to start challenging your, your perspective. It may even start as early as with like a seventh grade, a seven-year-old. So picture this, it's time for dinner. You call to your seven-year-old and you say, hey, honey, time for dinner, go wash your hands. And your seven-year-old says back to you, um, yeah, I don't want to, I'm not going to. <laughs> and you're like, uh, what happened? In this family, we wash our hands. Why are you suddenly not willing to wash your hands? Because I don't want to. And so most parents take one of two paths at that point. They say, well, I'm sorry, you don't have an option. I'm the parent, you're the kid, you gotta wash your hands, right? That's, that's really common parenting. The evolved parent does the same thing, but they do it through a form of manipulation they call encouraging cooperation. And the way they do it is like this. The reason you must wash your hands is because there are germs and they live on your hands. And if they get in your stomach, they're gonna make you sick. And we know this because of science, go wash your hands. <laughs> Same outcome is the goal. And they feel really so much smarter than the older generation because they're explaining to their child. But let's pause and think about this for a moment. That information about science, have you tested it? Do you know that's true? Do you live as though that's true? Because your child just ate a Cheerio off the floor and didn't get sick. Your child watched you at Target when the toddler bit out their pacifier. It landed on the target floor. You picked it up, sucked off the germs of all the feet that had just walked on that floor and popped it back in your baby's mouth. Do you believe in germs? <laughs> Haven't some of us done that in the presence of our children? Your child by saying, I don't want to wash my hands, may not be asking for a science lesson. And you maybe haven't even evaluated your own beliefs, you're just passing on what I call the parental propaganda program. And so the question your child is asking is, on what basis do I have to wash my hands right now? Says who? That's what's underneath it. So I recommend a completely different approach. In that moment, instead of assuming it is a battle for hand washing, get curious. And you can do this no matter what the topic. 
What about curfew? What about rock music? What about, what about, what about? When your child doesn't want to wash their hands. Oh, that's interesting. You washed your hands yesterday. You don't want to today. Tell me more about that. What's going on for you in hand washing? Your child might say so many different things. Your child might say, I hate the way the water feels on my hands. Well, that's an interesting comment. That has nothing to do with germs. So now you can ask more questions. Is it the wetness or the temperature? Because if it's the temperature, let's get a thermometer and let's slowly increase it till it's the right temperature. And then we'll know from now on, we've got to heat the water to that temperature. No, no, it's not the temperature. And maybe you try it and it doesn't solve the problem. Like, well, is it the wetness? Should we try hand sanitizer? Because that dries really quick. No, it's so sticky. Okay, well, what is it really? I just don't want to. I hate washing my hands. So now you have an opportunity. You can say to your child something along the lines of, you know what? I really like um, hand washing because I have this belief that the germs could get in your stomach and make you sick. So we have a couple of options here. You can either wash your hands or we can find another way to kill those germs. I hear heat works. Maybe we can just use a blow dryer on your hands and not use any water. Or we can just roll the dice and see if you get sick. Are you willing to try? <laughs> in other words, collaborate. Join them in the critical thinking journey. Let them gather more research, more experience, supply you with some ideas. Now, I know you're in a hurry. You don't have a time to go down this rabbit hole every time you get in the car seat and they don't want to buckle in or every time you need them to put on a coat when it's 40 degrees outside. Flip side, however, is that you can go down the rabbit hole once a month with a child. And the value in that is beyond anything you teach because what you are modeling is how a child conducts the inquiry inside of themselves. We want them to get to the point where they're thinking, why do I want to do this? Why don't I want to do that? Why would I respond to this commenter on Instagram? Why would I not? That's where we want them to go. So we want to start at that beginning. Someone says, how do you draw the line regarding negotiation with a young child? There's no line. This starts at two, starts at three. Sometimes you will exert parental control because of efficiency, because of safety, because you are responsible. But in those moments where you have an opportunity to go down the rabbit hole, take it. Help them experience themselves as thinkers. They have brains. They have experiences. They have questions. And they need the opportunity to discover for themselves, not just be fed information they must choose. Here's why. If you train them to believe that you have all the answers and they see you as the authority who provides them, when they get to eighth grade and they discover that their friends had different experiences and authorities, they will shift to their peer group as the new authority and they won't value their own thinking. They'll just move to the next authoritative source and they won't know how to process when my, um, my middle child was 15, he came to me, uh, there was a ballot measure in Ohio that he really valued, but he wasn't old enough to vote. So he did almost a PowerPoint presentation for me about all the reasons I should vote pro on this issue. I listened really patiently. We had a really good conversation. His ideas and his research were fabulous. At the end, he said to me, so are you going to vote pro? I said, actually, I'm still going to vote con. Tears shot from his eyes. And he said, mom, I count on you to be logical. <laughs> and I said to him in that moment, you did a fabulous job. All of your research makes sense. There are some things I think that you didn't account for, but that wasn't the goal of this conversation. We can hold two points of view simultaneously. And you know what? Your point of view may still win the day. Mine might be built from an archaic understanding, uh, a prejudice I grew up with that I'm just not ready to shed. But this is not a moment where we have to agree. This is a moment where you are showcasing your thinking and I'm letting you know mine. And we went forward that way. Today, my son is a human rights lawyer and he works for the UN in Central Africa. And he continued to care about 
issues and honing his arguments and his thoughts. And from the beginning, they have not fully aligned with mine. I have kids who hold very different political perspectives and spiritual points of view. Why? Because in our family, the underlying criteria for connection is not agreement. It is the opportunity to be heard. And so when you are raising your children, that starts early. We have to value their difference at an early point of time, not just when they turn 15, because at 15, they won't tell you their insides. If they believe it means excommunication or shunning or shouting down or being told why they're so wacky. One thing I will tell you is that 15 year olds change their minds and they have incomplete insight, but they are stirred by new ways of looking at the world. So they're going to say things like, Karl Marx is brilliant, or I want to be a vegan. I saw all the videos on the PETA website, or I hate being vegan like the family. I'm an omnivore, right? They're gonna say those kinds of things. And it's your opportunity to support them in aligning their behavior with their new thinking so they can experience what it's like to live out the belief, not just think it in their heads. We want them to have the opportunity in the context of our home to experience what it's like to think a different way and to grow from that thinking. The more we clutch our own ideas and treat them as the only way to think about the world, the less our kids have the freedom to show their thinking to us. One of the things that I have learned in this whole journey of working with families and writing this book is that kids want conversation partners, but what they often get are parent lecturers, parent correctors, parents giving the benefit of their years of experience. That's not necessary for growing a critical thinker. So I know that we're at the end here and it's probably time for Q&A time. This book um, inside, I've got activities for kids from five to 18. Every chapter divides them into three different levels of activities to go with the age ranges of your kids. And they are practical and they're not about politics. They're about grammar, they're about reasoning, they're about literature, they're about interpreting texts. So if you're looking for something to do with your kids, this book is really helpful. Thank you so much for joining me today and I'm ready for questions. Okay, Julie, I think you can see by the chat, people are truly overwhelmed. And I would say, I'm saying this directly to my team, Brenna, we have got to figure out a way that every parent in the world <laughs> sees this talk because it is so desperately needed. So, you know, oh. just setting just setting a little bit of a high bar. So first of all, we're going to pause for a nanosecond and just put up a survey so that we can... Uh, hear where people are from, even though you did such a good job at the beginning. And I just love hearing that we have people from kind of all over the universe. Um, and then also um, the person who won the gift card heard about that directly. And then wow. I also want to, um, in, 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 in guiding critical thinking, we have a really fascinating next lecture called Past Forward, The Legacy of Racism in Modern Day America with Khalil Gibran Muhammad from Harvard and Jeffrey Robinson on January 19th. It's like the third time we've had them. I want to come to that one. So it's send me the link. <laughs> so um, um, I'm going to just try and answer, get one question, which is, um, Getting, you know, your advice is just so critical, but what, what ways can you help just quickly guide parents in, I mean, you gave us, get your kids off their cell phones, get critical <laughs> thinking. Um, yeah, I can talk about teens? screens. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, it's overwhelming. How do you help over to older teens navigate like when everyone else has no rules and no limits and like give the silver lining upside to this as like, I think it'll be our closing comment from you. Yeah, no, it's such a great question. So what we're hoping to encourage with teens is self-regulation, right? They shouldn't have to depend on parents to tell them when to get on and off the computer. 
So one of the places to start, even if you don't have teens yet, is actually asking meaningful questions. Like when you see your teen or your child get frustrated in a game, something you can do is say, looks like you're getting frustrated. Can I make you a snack? Do you want to get off for a minute and discuss what's bothering you on this level? And let's think through an alternate strategy so you can break through. In other words, treat gaming, treat computer time as a meaningful part of their life, not as just the icing on the cake or the reward for good behavior. It is the vital part of their lives. Another thing to do is to ask your kids if you can play the game with them or if you can sit and watch their chat, send them text messages. I remember one night when my kids were teens, we were all sitting in the family room. We were all on our own little phones. And this is a while ago, you know, not what today's online life looks like. And we were all on Facebook Messenger. And the next thing you know, we were all talking individual conversations to each other only in the same room, sending links. There'd like be laughter over here and then suddenly over here. Like use the tools to connect. Don't treat the tools like they're only about disconnection. The other thing to do is to openly narrate your own struggle with social media and your phone. Say it out loud. You're having breakfast and you say, gosh, I really want to scroll. I'm going to put my phone away and connect with you. Um, weirdly, millennials and teens seem to be getting better at this than my age. My age is totally addicted to their phones. But there is this sense that presence means the phone isn't on. And so you can establish that as a family habit. When you have the phone, I can't connect to you. So when we're having tea or we're having breakfast, phone's away and I will abide by it as well. So create some routines, some times of day when phones and screens are off and when they're on, really connect with them around it. Don't treat it like it's ruining their lives. I think that's terrific. I think, you know, one thing that, you know, you're, you're, you're talking about with social media and live experiences, you know, there's a lot of disrupting media right now. Yes. There's a lot of places where it's such a great place for us to be side by side with our kids and discerning and not, and, and looking to the disruptors in the media space that offer more clear, you know, they're not so shareholder driven necessarily. Yes. And so, you know, that is a place that I would really encourage, you know, look at, we're in that business. Yeah, to really encourage you with your kids um, to to investigate what that looks like. Um, do we want to just address quickly? There are two questions that are so similar, and I sure, just go felt ahead. like they're so important. Absolutely, marginalized groups, human rights issues, racism. Yes, genocide wrong, right? Racism wrong. These are categorically wrong. We know this, but what we're talking about when we're talking about them is. On what grounds are we dealing with these issues and on what basis are they still persisting in our culture? So I recommend in the book a whole bunch of stuff around identity, how to create a reading list that draws from a variety of authors and experiences. It is critical that when we help our kids understand these, we aren't just handing them propaganda. We're giving them experiences and encounters so that they are capable of standing on their own two feet in the face of the pressure to ignore those issues. So yeah, I this is not a homogenization, also not about empathy. It's about actually seeking to understand so that we can build a much better world with each other. Phenomenal. Thank you. I mean, all I can say to our attendees is every time I join our lectures, I'm like, they get better every time. And Julie, so fantastic. And really, you know, this is our mission is to share this information out. So whether Thank you're you. in Australia or New York or Detroit, Seattle, share it. And Thank the you. messaging is just so critically important. So thank you all for your time. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.